Welcome, everyone. Welcome to this RSET webinar series on applications of remote sensing for monitoring the water budget within river basins. Uh, my name is Amita Mehta, and uh, myself and my colleague Sean McCartney will be conducting this series along with a couple of guest speakers. Uh, so with that, we will start this webinar series. The overall training objectives are, um, this is an introductory webinar, so we want to become familiar with remote sensing and earth system modeling data, which are relevant for river basin management. And in addition, we will have demonstration of how to estimate surface water budget and how to assess their special temporal variability in sub-watersheds within river basins. And this is this will be done by using remote sensing and GIS. So these are overall training objectives. There will be four sessions. Each will be approximately one hour, followed by question and answer sessions. But today's session will focus on overview of remote sensing data for river basin monitoring. Uh, and then subsequently, we will have two guest speakers uh, showing demonstration and applications of remote sensing for river basin monitoring. We'll be focusing on two major river basins, Nile Basin and Mekong Basin. So these two will be on 20th of March and 27th of March. And the last session, which is going to be on 4th of April, will demonstrate how to estimate surface freshwater budget using remote sensing and modeling data from NASA. Uh, as shown here, we already have a, an example in which we used a small watershed over which surface water budget was estimated. We are going to present two case studies focusing on two major rivers, as we will see later today, uh, and then show how to use remote sensing data, tools, and GIS to do surface water budget estimation. There's some information here about homework and certificate. Those of you who have taken RSET webinars, you are familiar with this uh, procedure. But those of you who are new, uh, usually we have certificate at the end of the webinar series. And for that, uh, there are a number of conditions. First of all, we will have homework, which will be available uh, after session two and session four. And these will be available from RSET website. Uh, we will have these posted and as Google form, and so answers have to be given online. Due dates for these homeworks, the first one is due by 4th April and the second one by 7th April. And certificate of completion will be awarded to those participants who have attended all four live sessions and completed both homework assignments. So after the completion of the series, after a couple of months, Marina Martins, she will send you a certificate of completion of this webinar series. With that, we want to start with today's session. And here is an overall, overall outline. Uh, we'll start with a brief introduction to RSET. For those of you who are new to RSET program, we want you to know about RSET a little more. Then we will go right into river basin monitoring and management. Why is it important? What is required for river basin management? Then we will go on overview of remote sensing data sources, which are relevant for river basin monitoring and management. And we will focus on two aspects in this series. So today we'll talk about river basin delineation. We need to know how to define or find out what the river basin area is. So we will talk about that. And then we will talk about remote sensing data, which uh, provide surface water budget components. And then we will have a demonstration of how to use a web tool to do river basin delineation. So this is overall outline for today. We'll start with a brief introduction to RSET. So RSET is a part of NASA's Applied Sciences Capacity Building Program. And the goal here is to empower global community through remote sensing training. Um, so goals really is to increase earth science data in decision making 
through training to policymakers, environmental managers, and other professionals, both in public and private sectors. And RCEP focuses on themes shown here, uh, water resources, disasters, eco and air quality management, and monitoring. So these are the themes that RCEP provides training on. RCEP program started in 2008, and as you can see, uh, different themes were added uh, for different years. And at the end of last year, RCEP has conducted 100 plus trainings and have trained 13,000 plus participants covered over 106 countries and have reached uh, to more than 3,500 organizations. And so this is overall uh, performance for RCEP trainings. And as I mentioned earlier, there are levels of trainings. There are fundamental levels, which is available online and it's on demand. You can go in and watch fundamentals of remote sensing. Uh, then introductory is level one, which requires that you have a little knowledge of remote sensing. And then the most advanced training, which requires level one training or equivalent knowledge so that then you can go in depth focusing on specific uh, topic or application. Our set website is shown here, and this is going to be the home of all the training material for this webinar. Also, you will see that homework will be posted here and all the information will be available from this website. Uh, you can explore this website for different trainings, and there is also a listserv that you can sign up for to stay in touch with RCET activities. So with that, we will start uh, to talk about river basin monitoring and management. We're going to start with why is it important and what kind of approach is needed. In doing so, we are also introducing some of the definitions that we're going to use throughout this webinar series. So when we say a river basin, so what is a river basin? And as shown here, example is of Colorado River Basin. And this is the Colorado River with many tributaries and streams around it. So river basin is an area of land that drains water into a river and its tributary. So the basin includes area that drains into tributaries and this river. A river basin usually has multiple drainage catchments or watersheds. So we will use watersheds or subwater basin. These are the words we will use throughout this webinar series to talk about small portion of a river basin where uh, water is draining. And these watersheds are usually separated by ridges and hills. They're called drainage divide. So again, when we call drainage divide we talk about that we're talking about ridges and hills that isolate a sub watershed or sub water basin each watershed I'm sorry in a river basin collects rain and or snow water and it drains into a common outlet such as a stream or a tributary lake or wetland eventually all this water makes its way to the river that we are talking about and a river basin consists of not just surface water or stream flow uh, that we see on surface. It also includes uh, underlying groundwater uh, underneath the basin. So that's also part of the overall river basin water. Why is it important uh, to monitor or manage river basins? So first of all, River basins, uh, which connect rivers with surrounding land, hydrology, ecology, and socioeconomic components within basins. So it's very important. It's the major source of fresh water. So it, it, the river that receives water from entire basin is, is the lifeblood of that area. It's a major source of fresh water drinking, uh, for drinking and also for agricultural activities. Um, these river basins, uh, because they are specially and temporally very dynamic, effective uh, management and monitoring for availability of fresh water, it really has to be monitored closely. 
So rivers, which receive water from river basins, they support a variety of aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. They provide means of transportation and hydropower generations in many cases. So because rivers are so important, river basins which feed water to these rivers and processes going within those river basins, they are very important. This figure shows on the left hand side major river basins of the world and these rivers are listed here by continents. Um, so this is from UNEP and then you can see that within all these river basins there are many many small rivers and tributaries. So there is also a world atlas, the river of the world. The website is given here. You can find information about major rivers and streams of the world. Uh, so these um, are important resources to learn more about major river basins and also uh, rivers by their size and by the river basin um, area. Okay, so as we saw, the rivers are a major uh, source of water. Why is it important? to manage river basins. So first of all, um, it's important or it's crucial because for water allocation and distribution and sharing among different stakeholders, states and regions within a country or among various countries because rivers span a large area, it's important that river basin is managed properly. That ensures proper water allocation. So that's a major reason why river basins have to be managed. As you see on the left hand side, he, this is a uh, image from World Resources Institute's aqueduct um, web tool. Uh, it, this is showing water stress. So all the uh, real, light yellow to yellow are low to medium water stress area, whereas red areas are all high water stress area. And you can see that a large number of uh, Africa and Asia, their water stress. So for managing water in water stress area where there is flood and drought can be severe at a time, uh, it's very important that river basins are managed properly. In addition, there is a report by UN Water. You can see there's a transboundary water uh, report and it clearly states why river basin management is very important because rivers um, they go they span multiple countries there are 263 transboundary river basins covering about half the earth's surface about 145 states have territory within transboundary lakes or river basins and 30 countries lie entirely within transboundary rivers and it has been noted that since 1948, there are 37 incidents of acute conflict over water. Um, and um, there are, as a result of that, in so many years, about 295 international water agreements have been negotiated and signed. So because rivers pass through a number of territories and countries, um, managing basins ensures that water is uh, properly distributed among all stakeholders. And that's why river basin management is important. This figure uh, is from Global Runoff Data Center. So now as uh, water becomes more important as world's population is getting larger and um, as water distribution becomes a major issue, a uh, number of centers have focused on river basin management. Uh, this particular uh, website provides runoff data or stream flow for a number of rivers of the world. And as stated, these river systems are lifeblood of our planet and they're integral part of the global climate system. So such as feedback to many geophysical processes and lo local, regional and global scales. So overall, uh, tying climate, hydrology, uh, ecology, and socioeconomic uh, sectors, river basin management is very important. So what does it involve? It involves policies and decisions at river basin scales, which guide actions at 
sub basins or watershed level and that include sustainable water supplies for all stakeholders that means domestic or municipal water distribution industrial and agriculture then flood and drought management also is very important for overall river basin management improved land and ecosystem management and improved sanitation all these are required for effective river basin management so according to un waters um, some factors um, which uh, make good river basin management or best practice for good river basin management are listed here uh, first of all it's multi-level involvement of stakeholders from different sectors and different regions uh, next it is data and information so at basin level organization is needed in order to implement integrated water resources management so that means data and information about water supply and demand and application and usage they are required and human right to water is key in addressing access to drinking water so that has to be the central theme that um, human lives are not suffering because of lack of river basin management then trust between stakeholders from different sectors is also required for good management and last but not the least is capacity building for all stakeholders and that involves um, making them informed about all the issues in the river basin uh, and also what kind of data and information are available so stakeholders have to be familiar with uh, river basin issues we are going to focus on data and information part so for overall integrated river basin management data and information are very important and this webinar will actually focus on that particular issue so for river basin management then what kind of data and information are needed so primarily it requires monitoring water availability and water demand within the basin so water availability depends on basin hydrology and ecology and we will go through this figure in a minute and it influences significantly by weather and climate so you can see here that for a any region or watershed or a sub watershed availability of water depends on precipitation on snow melt or reservoir which collects water from either rain or snow melt there is a stream or river flowing through this watershed then inflow of water within the watershed and outflow so difference really tells you how much water is there um, in 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 the watershed this is all natural source of water for this watershed in addition there there could be man-made components so there's groundwater pumping that can add water to the watershed these are all sources of water the sinks or usage of water is domestic use as shown here could be for industrial use for irrigation and agricultural use or there could be natural vegetation that uses water so loss of water usually occurs to surface in in several ways one is um, water can evaporate or transpirate into the atmosphere that is a loss to the watershed some water gets stored into the soil layer and some gets infil infiltrates into the aquifer or groundwater level and there is outflow both at surface level also at the groundwater outflow is there so to know how much water is usable and available all these components have to be estimated and known that tells you how much water actually is available for using and at the same time demands also have to be known so how uh, so population agricultural land industrial use and natural vegetation if there is wetland how much water is stored in there so overall water budget is extremely important for river basin management so monitoring water availability within the river basin is crucial and this is very uh, important for efficient management also please note that 
Water quality monitoring is also very important. Sometimes water quality is not such that it can be usable. So water quality is an important part of overall management. However, for this webinar, we're focusing on water quantity. So we're going to look at different water budget components to see how one can estimate availability of fresh water at watershed level, um, sub-basin level, and then overall at a basin level. What, what else is required for river basin management is accurate identification and delineation of watersheds and stream channels within the basin. So because in a big river basin, there can be several watersheds with different types of processes, different types of soil, vegetation, topography. So accurate identification of how much area is draining into a particular tributary or a ch uh, stream channel is very important. Then characteristics of the basin in terms of what kind of soil and infiltration is going on, what kind of vegetation, are there lakes and reservoirs, uh, what kind of um, groundwater characteristics there, these are also important. And information about water demand for all sectors all these are important component for river basin management. In this webinar, we'll focus on application of remote sensing based data for access to river networks and assessing surface water budget components. So basically we will talk about how to delineate a watershed and then talk about how to estimate water budget components on surface level to, um, to estimate water budget in river basin. So we'll start with overview of remote sensing data sources relevant for river basin monitoring and management. So first we will talk about river basin delineation. Then we will go on talking about surface water budget components. Starting with river basin network delineation, there is a tool which was developed by uh, World Wildlife Fund. It's called HydroShed. It's a hydrological data and maps based on shuttle elevation de derivatives at multiple scales. So HydroShed provides data sets of stream networks, watershed boundaries and drainage direction, flow accumulation, uh, distances and river topology. And HydroShed is based on remote sensing data from a radar that flew on Space Shuttle Endeavour. It's called Shuttle Radar Topography Mission or SRTM. It's a C-band radar. It was, it was flown in 2001 and it carried um, a number, number of orbits around Earth and that is used to derive topography or terrain uh, on, on the Earth. So in the appendix, you will see a number of slides uh, talking about SRTM and how to get SRTM terrain data. What we're going to look at here is how SRTM is used in HydroShed in uh, delineating river network. These websites are um, important for information about HydroSheds. And as shown here, data set development is described in detail here in this USGS uh, portal. So hydroshed data development, so all the information, how data void filling is done, how stream identification and hydrological conditions are derived by using GIS, how there are spurious features removed, then also adjustment in coastal zones, to reduce the impact of mangroves and vegetations on terrain data that is described. Uh, stream burning or to enforce known river courses onto an elevation surface. So it's matching ground and remote sensing data to make sure that streams are properly represented. That is done and that is described uh, in here also. Uh, modeling valley courses to improve river delineation um, it's it, especially in low lying area that has also been conducted. And finally, quality checking of river network. And it is found that there is some uncertainty when there is flat and vegetated areas 
uh, there are some uncertainties, but then there are some corrections done as mentioned here. So this website has a lot of details about how these data are derived. So we recommend that you uh, go through uh, some of these if you want to know more about data sets. So these data sets are available um, in different files. So this is how to get the data. Here is the website and information. Most um, data, they are stored as this file name convention, extent, data type, and resolution. So extent is by each continent. So river basins for each continent are stored in different files. Uh, as listed here, Africa, Asia, Australasia, Europe, North and South America. And data types are quite a few. There's digital elevation model. There is hydro hydrologically conditioned elevation, drainage direction, flow accumulation, and that is just number of sales, cells upstreams of a particular location, uh, river, network which is what we're looking for or streamlines and drainage basins or watershed boundaries and they all have different resolutions and they're identified by arc seconds or in degree or in meters and as you can see ranges from 90 meters all the way up to 10 kilometers as we will see the river networks are available at 500 meters so how to get the data we saw and what kind of formats they are in so all these data are esri compatible so they're they can be used in gis they're either raster or vector format and they are in geographic uh, format so it's wgs 84 format um, so digital elevation model uh, hydrologically condition elevation direction and flow accumulation, these are all raster data. And as you can see, uh, they vary um, in, in resolution. So elevations are available in meters. Uh, drainage direction is given as numbers. And here is the figure that shows, that represents uh, direction. So this is eastward, this is westward. Um, similarly, you have, uh, Flow accumulation is the number of upstream cells training into um, each cell. And then unique identifier and maximum flow accumulation number of cells, that is river network. And unique identifier and surface area in kilometers, that is drainage basin. Both these are available at, as you can see, 500 uh, meter uh, resolution. So raster data are also available as uh, binary format. It's a uh, band interleaved by line or bill format. Those of you are familiar with it, but best thing would be to use GIS to access this data or visualize and um, analyze this data. So this talks about hydroshed or how to get river network. Towards the end of this session, we will have a demonstration of how to use HydroShed to get a particular river basin or identify a particular river network. So we will see that. For now, we're going to talk about monitoring water availability in river basins. So as we said, this delineating river and then monitoring water within that river, these two are very important. So monitoring water availability in a basin, which flows in streams within the basin requires information, observations, and modeling of water budget components in the basin, as we saw earlier. What are the components um, that make the ultimate flow in the river? One is precipitation, which is the source. Then evaporation and transpiration, which is a loss of water to the watershed, which goes in the atmosphere, water goes in the atmosphere. Infiltration, that water is lost to surface, it goes either in the subsurface soil or in uh, aquifer level or ground water level. And then surface water, which is soil moisture and reservoirs. And there's groundwater storage also has to be known and runoff 
The runoff is the water that runs off land into the stream and eventually out of the watershed uh, or sub-basin. So water flow in a stream or river depends on the following components, as we saw. And as shown here, so precipitation and soil moisture reservoir information, so lake level or water in the reservoir and groundwater storage, they can be obtained from surface-based data. Also, remote sensing observations are available for these parameters. Evapotranspiration and infiltration, they depend on um, soil characteristics, soil moisture, terrain and slope, and vegetation information, and they can be calculated based on other observable geophysical parameters. That means they're not directly observable. Evaporation and transpiration, they have to be calculated based on other observable. The runoff is something that has to be calculated as a residue of water balance equation. Um, one can uh, measure stream flow in streams uh, using stream gauges, but runoff over basin usually has to be estimated or calculated um, based on other water budget components. So this is the overall setting up for estimating uh, river basin water budget. There are surface-based observations for some of these parameters. So river discharge is um, shown here. It's measured by stream gauge, and it's available from these global runoff data centers. In the US, USGS also provides detailed information uh, based on stream gauge data. NOAA also has this information. Precipitation, there are rain gauges, as you can see, um, all over the world. And uh, Global Precipitation Climatology Center provides graded rain gauge data with a two degree by two degree. And so this is available. Uh, soil moisture, uh, there is a network. Uh, you can uh, look at the website where uh, soil moisture data are available based on uh, surface observations. As you can see, there are many regions which are data void. Um, certain uh, regions, they have a lot of soil moisture observations, but they're not everywhere. Evapotranspiration can usually be measured uh, by either lysimeters or eddy covariance or flux towers. So these are again, their calculation has to be done for evapotranspiration. But these are usually point measurements. As you can see, all of them are point measurements. Um, and uh, they all have different spatial and temporal coverage. So they're very important, but they're point measurements and have non-uniform coverage. As you can see, uh, not everywhere there are, um, there are all the observations are present. And uh, there are many, many data void regions. So monitoring water budget components based on remote sensing uh, can be done by using a number of satellites. And as we will see, it, it has a better spatial and temporal coverage. So rain um, is available. Precipitation can be available from satellites, which are TRIM and GPM. This is Tropical Rainfall Measuring Mission and Global Precipitation Mission. Uh, evapotranspiration is available from satellites, they are Landsat, Terra, and Aqua. Soil moisture is available from soil moisture active passive. Runoff is something has to be calculated, not available from satellites. Groundwater and reservoir height, these are also available from satellites. So GRACE and GRACE follow on. These two satellites provide information about groundwater. And reservoir height can be obtained from satellites such as JSON 1, 2, and 3 satellites. So 2 and 3 are flying currently. So these are all uh, reasonably long-term data sets that provide information about water budget components listed here. Again, we are going to focus primarily on precipitation, evapotranspiration, soil moisture, and runoff, uh, which basically are required to look at surface water budget. And there, in addition, if we're going to look at earth system model, something called 
global land data assimilation system, which uses remote sensing data in a model to give all the water budget component. So these are the um, sources for um, getting water budget components. And then using that, one can estimate overall water budget in a watershed or river basin. So just to summarize all the satellite missions, they are useful for water budget components that we just saw in the previous table, which is TRIM, uh, GPM, Landsat, Terra Aqua, SMAP, GRACE and GRACE follow on and JSON. And the duration for which they are available, they're also given here. Um, as you can see, um, current precipitation or that which is the source of the, uh, water availability is available from GPM. And um, there are satellites which also ended such as Trim and Grace, but they are also very important uh, for looking at historical perspective of uh, water budget or water availability. To summarize, here is a table which talks which sensors are there on these satellites. Um, what kind of measurements are done by these sensors or instruments, and which component is derived from these measurements. So if you want more details, there is a fundamental uh, of remote sensing on-demand webinar available from our set website. It has details of each of these sensor about measurements and how uh, components are derived. So we we'll, won't go in great detail. Uh, we recommend that you go through this webinar if you want more information. But what we want to focus on is that there are on trim and GPM, these are microwave radiometer and radar uh, with multiple microwave frequencies. And it focuses on getting precipitation. Terra and Aqua has multiple sensors, but the one that we are going to focus on is MODIS, which is moderate resolution imaging spectral radiometer. And it has uh, spectral measurements in visible to near and middle infrared um, re region. It is a versatile instrument that provides snow cover, and it's used for looking at vegetation and deriving evapotranspiration. Landsat 7 and 8, which have also visible um, and near infrared to thermal infrared channels. Um, these are thematic mapper and an enhanced thematic mapper and operational land imagers. And that is used for um, vegetation cover and evapotranspiration monitoring. Uh, SMAP is a microwave radiometer, uh, L band, and it provides soil moisture. And then again, these are also microwave um, instruments. They provide groundwater and reservoir height. What we're going to focus on for precipitation from trim and GPM is something um, not just from core trim and GPM, but there is a, there is a rainfall product, which is a multi-satellite um, merged algorithm or product. Both TRIM and GPM core satellites, they're used to calibrate microwave observations from a number of national and international satellites. And so then, not just TRIM and GPM, but combined with other satellites, they provide improved spatial and temporal coverage of precipitation um, over the globe. So TRIM multi-satellite precipitation analysis algorithm is called TMPA, and the one uh, which is extended for GPM. It's called Integrated Multi-Satellite Retrievals for GPM or iMERGE. So we are going to focus on these two products, TMPA and iMERGE, uh, for, for precipitation data. So it is combining TRIM and GPM with other national and international satellites. And these two are widely used uh, products for applications, such as for flood and drought monitoring and also for water budget estimation. So iMERGE, which we are going to look at for um, river basin uh, water budget estimation, um, is 
um, available in different formats. So there are multiple products. So early, late, and final iMERGE products are available. Uh, early is has five hours latency, and this is used for flood monitoring or flash flood monitoring. Late, which is 12 hours latency, that is used more for crop irrigation management uh, and looking at how much water there is within a day or so. And then the final product, which is the research quality product, it is a has three months latency. This has satellite data and in which rain gauge data based on surface measurements are also uh, combined with it. So there is a latency for that. We are going to look at basically um, some of the early and late uh, products for, for iMERGE. These data are available every half hour and at one tenth of uh, degree resolution. And there are value added products available at three hours and one, three, and seven days. So iMERGE is, uh, will be focusing on this to look at uh, water availability. TNPA, which um, is similar to iMERGE, but which has lower resolution and a different satellite constellation. It is quarter degree um, and has three hour uh, temporal resolution, but this is a long-term data set. And although uh, TRIM is no longer flying, TMPA is widely used for hydrologic and flood modeling. Um, and soon iMERGE and TMPA will be uh, combined together to make a long uh, time series of precipitation starting from 1998 onwards to present. So uh, focusing on this because for any river basin, precipitation is the major source of water. And these two data sets um, they provide um, information about availability of water on from days to two years, so on, on multiple time scales. These data, uh, TMP and iMERGE, they are available from precipitation measurement mission site. And there's also information available from this, there's training material available how to access this data. There's a quick access through this get data. Now you can download data, uh, you can visualize data by using different tools as well. What we are going to focus on, we're going to use a web tool which is called Giovanni. And those of you who have taken RSET webinars, they may be familiar with this site, but this is a, a useful site for data search, data access, uh, data visualization, and download. So what you can see is that it has a keyword search where you can search by um, any name. So either you can have sensor or satellite name, or you can have parameter name, and it will come up with list of parameters. So if you type iMERGE or TMPA, you will be led to the place where you can get this data. You can select data by temporal and special criteria based on map or based on watershed or uh, river basin uh, shape files. Um, you can choose shape files for different countries and states also. And you can have multiple analysis options such as maps, time series, um, comparison of different data sets, the zonal average and histograms, and you can plot data and you can download data as well. So we will have a demonstration of this um, later. So evapotranspiration is the next component. Um, and this is a sum of evaporation uh, from land surface and transpiration from plants as shown here. So ET actually is a sink to surface water. So it transfers water from surface to atmosphere. And because water has to evaporate, there is energy needed to, to do this, uh, to convert liquid to water in the vapor. There are challenges in estimation ET because ET depends on multiple variables. So solar radiation uh, received by the surface, land and air temperature difference, humidity difference between surface and air, 
surface wind speed, uh, soil conditions, vegetation cover and types. Also, it's highly variable in space and time. As you can see, these are different fields and these are areas outside that could be natural vegetation or there could be no vegetation. So it's highly variable in space and also in time. And there are multiple ET products though, based on uh, remote sensing data. So MODIS vegetation index is used to derive uh, evapotranspiration. Also thermal infrared bands from MODIS, Landsat 8 and global geostationary satellites, they are also used to derive evapotranspiration. We will look at some of these products. So ET from MODIS, um, this is available from both Terra and Aqua satellites. The uh, product name is given here. So MOD 16A2 and MYD 16A2 from different satellites. They are available at uh, 500 meter resolution. So this is really uh, calculated based on vegetation and other parameters. The re temporal resolution is eight days and it, the coverage is from 2010 to present and it, it, it continues. So LPDAC is the land, proce uh, land surface processing DAC that has information about this data, how it is derived, the references provided here. To access this data, so MODIS with based evapotranspiration, um, Earth data, NASA Earth data tool has to be used. This uh, tool requires user registration, but once you register, the data are open and free. And so you can search data by the product name, which we just showed, like this is the evapotranspiration product, uh, 16A2. Uh, this is from Terra. And there are special and temporal uh, selection here. Uh, you can draw a rectangle or uh, you can give a shape file here. You can select dates. And when you search, you will get all the data available within your search area like in here, and then you can just go ahead and download those data. So it's simple and easy. You just have to register through the website, know which product you're looking for, and then just download according to your search criteria. So this is basically all the options. Next, it's the ET from Landsat. So we just saw ET from Motis. Now this is ET from Landsat. Um, Landsat has, as we saw, this is 500 um, meter resolution. Landsat provides much higher resolution. That's about 30 meters. Even individual fields can be resolved here. Um, this particular evapotranspiration product, which is called Matrix, mapping and evapotranspiration at higher resolution with internalized calibration. Um, the reference is provided here. This is available every 16 days starting in 2011. And it is available from EE Flux. It's a Google Earth engine based tool where you can pick a particular Landsat image by pointing at the area of your interest. You can move this bubble where you are interested in and then search all the Landsat images available. And by selecting images, then you can actually uh, cal click to calculate evapotranspiration. And then you can download this data as well. So this is also a easily navigable tool which provides high resolution ET data based on Landsat. Next product is a multi-satellite evapotranspiration from Atmosphere Land Exchange Inverse or LXE. This actually is derived by using energy balance model. So land surface temperature in, is used to derive how much energy is used for evapotranspiration and based on that evapotranspiration is derived. It actually uses MODIS and Landsat and is also now combining geostationary satellites to get a good coverage 
to get um, evapotranspiration. So LXC radiation, uh, evapotranspiration um, is um, shown here. So this is coast geostationary satellite. This is MODIS and Landsat. And more details can be found by one of the RSET um, webinars we did a couple of years ago has information about um, LXC evapotranspiration. To access evapotranspiration by LXC, you can use um, this Surveyor Global website. Uh, this data are available at five kilometer resolution. So now you can see that MODIS evapotranspiration is at 500 meters, Landsat based at 30 meters, and LXC is five kilometers. So depending on your size of your river basin, you can pick um, evapotranspiration data. Temporal resolution is four week and 12 week composites. And it, this started in coverage is a little longer, 2001 to present. And you can visualize this um, using ArcGIS or Google Earth. So visualization can be done here through this website also. So we looked at precipitation from Treman GPM and evapotranspiration from multiple platforms. The next uh, water budget component is soil moisture. And so this is available from SMAP mission. Um, this measures moisture in top five centimeter of soil. Okay. Soil moisture is derived from L band radiometer. There used to be a radar flying on SMAP also, but that uh, stopped operating um, just after the launch. And so now um, synthetic aperture radar from Sentinel um, is used in a combination with this radiometer data to come up with um, soil moisture product. So special resolution of this product is 36 kilometers and nine kilometers. Both these are available. Temporal resolution is three days. Entire globe is covered in about three days. And the data are available since March of 2015 and to present. SMAP data can be downloaded from National Snow and Ice Data Centers. If you go to this website and pick soil moisture, then you can have level two, which is the swath by swath data, level three, which is gridded data, uh, and then level four, which are combined with model data. These are all available from this site. You can search, uh, click on it, uh, read and then get the data. So this is the site where you can get the data. Another way to get soil moisture data is through this site called Appears. This tool, uh, which is application for extracting and exploring analysis radius samples, allows you to extract data by custom shapefile. You can upload your own shapefile and get data for that. So you can upload your watershed in their uh, shapefile and get data for that. There is temporal selection. So um, then there is um, extract data within a box or a file, polygon shapefile. You can just draw a box also. And then you can pick data format. Here, uh, GeoTIFF is available. And then you can just submit data extraction request. Um, then you will be sent an email to download this data. So this is more um, user friendly or there is more um, options to to do spatial and temporal uh, extraction and picking data so this also is a useful tool to get soil moisture okay so you will have to choose which data there are multiple data sets available but you can choose um, smap data so we already saw how to get precipitation, evapotranspiration, and soil moisture from different satellites and using different web tools. Um, as we mentioned earlier, surface runoff, which is a part of the water budget uh, estimation, it's not available directly from remote sensing. It has to be calculated. So for that, here we're introducing a global land data assimilation system. It's a modeling system which is based on water and energy balance. 
uh, approach and more information can be found from this LDAS website. What it does is that model uses these inputs from remote sensing. So rainfall is used from TMPA. Other meteorological data are used from global reanalysis. And there are vegetation mask, land water mask, leaf area index. These are all used from MODIS. And there is also cloud and snow information used uh, from different NOAA and uh, Defense Meteorological Satellite Program satellites. So these are used as input to a land data assimilation system and integrated outputs are available which provide soil moisture, evapotranspiration, surface and subsurface runoff and something that is important also for certain river basins is snow water equivalent or snow melt is also available from this system. Um, re reference is provided here which describes this system. Uh, so more information can be found from this website and again GLDAS data are available from Giovanni that we saw earlier. These data are available at quarter degree resolution. They are available at every three hours and also every month and temporal coverage is 2002 present. So GL does, it integrates remote sensing data with modeling system and provides integrated water budget information. So we will be using this tool, GL does data, to estimate uh, water budget for a number of river basins. So why do we use remote sensing and modeling data? Uh, what are the advantages? for looking at a say, river basin. So first of all, remote sensing based data provide near global to global coverage compared to surface based data, which are specially non-uniform as we saw earlier and they are point measurements. Uh, also, remote sensing data provide data where surface measurements are not available. So earth system models, as we saw, they integrate surface-based and remote sensing observations, and they provide uniformly gridded, more frequent information on multiple water budget components. So runoff is available as part of modeling system, which you cannot observe directly from remote sensing. Earth system models, they provide parameters that aren't directly observed, as we said. So ET also is calculated, runoff also is calculated not just surface, but subsurface um, components of soil moisture and runoff are also available from modeling system. So these are some of the advantages of using uh, these data for water budget calculations. These data are free. Um, they're available from web-based tools, so you can subset temporally and specially, and you can do online analysis. You can explore different data sets and pick the best Pick that is the best for your own region or for your own watershed. And data are available in near real time and past data are also available uh, for in some cases more than a decade. There are also challenges in using these data. So all freshwater components are measured by different satellites and sensors with different spatial and temporal resolutions and coverage and quality itself. So satellite and model data, they're all the large data sets, they're different data formats, they're stored in different locations, and so you have to use different tools to access them. So there is a little bit of learning curve here, and some training is required to use this data. So while these data are generally validated with selected surface measurements, we recommend that um, you, rec you validate them for your own region also. And there is sometimes additional processing is required um, in order to uh, get what uh, the information you want. So that's why um, these trainings are designed to help uh, access this data and, um, and conduct the analysis that you want to. So with that, what we saw today, I just want to summarize, is that we looked at how to uh, use hydro 
Hydrochat to get river network data and looked at different satellites and GLDAS system to get uh, water budget components for river basins. Next, we are going to have a demonstration of data access using Hydrochat. So how can you um, delineate a watershed or river basin of your interest? So for this webinar, we are going to focus on two rivers. So first is Parana River Basin, which is um, in South America. It's spanning multiple countries, uh, including Brazil and Argentina. So this is a transboundary river. And the next river is Potomac River Basin, which is here in the US in the Northeast. And it passes through a number of states. So these two rivers we are going to focus on for this webinar. So my colleague, Sean McCartney, is going to show you how to use Hydroshed to delineate these basins. And in subsequent sessions, so actually in fourth session, we are going to go ahead and use these two river basins to estimate water budget components for different sub-watershed as shown here, and then for entire basin. So with that, um, I want to hand this over to um, Sean. Um, Sean, you can uh, now demonstrate Hydroshed uh, River Network tool. Thank you. Thank you, Amida. The following part of the training will be downloading and pre-processing Hydroshed's data for analysis. All tools used in this demonstration are open source tools. First, use a web browser and go to www.hydrosheds.org. The products provided by Hydrosheds were developed by the Conservation Science Program of World Wildlife Fund in partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey and other institutions located at the bottom of the webpage. Hydrosheds provides hydrographic information in a comprehensive format for regional and global scale applications. In this exercise, we're going to download Hydrobasins data. Hydrobasins is a series of polygon shapefiles that depict watershed boundaries and sub-basin delineations at a global scale and were derived from Hydrosheds data. Hydrobasin products follow the FAFSA code coding system and provide levels 1 to 12 globally. For detailed information on the coding system, refer to the website. The first thing to do in downloading data is to click on the download button and register with your email and your password and create a password. Once you've successfully registered, you can sign in and access the Hydrobasins data. Once logged in, you will now have access to a web page with elevation data, drainage directions, river networks, and other data sets in raster and vector format. In this exercise, we are downloading the river basin and sub-basins for the Piranha River in South America. The Piranha River is the second longest river in South America after the Amazon River. To download data for the Piranha River Basin, click on the arrow next to Hydra Basins. These files are all in Esri shapefile format. To have the option, you have the option of choosing the standard without lakes or the customized with lakes. We're going to choose customized with lakes for this example. Scroll down and view the options for South America. The 12 levels listed below follow the Fafstetter coding system mentioned earlier. Hydrobasins data are provided as individual polygon shapefiles, one for each FAFSTATR coding level. File names follow the syntax of the dataset, hydrobasins, followed by basins with lakes, and then SA, which stands for South America. And in this case, it's showing that this is a level three uh, shapefile. If you are familiar with the coding system and know what subbasins you require for your work, you can download the subset of data directly. If you are unsure of what subbasin you require for your analysis, you can download uh, subbasins 1 to 6 or all comprehensive data set 1 to 12. In this case, we will download levels 1 to 12. Once that is selected, 
go up to download selected files and then you can submit your request. Once you receive an email with a link to your data, you can click on the link in your email to download the selected file. You can then go to your download folder and unzip the folder received from Hydrosheds. We can then move this folder to a working folder that we've already created. In this case, I created a folder on my desktop. For this demo, we'll be using the open source GIS software QGIS. Open the files in QGIS. We'll be selecting each shapefile provided us by Hydro Basins. As stated earlier, the first level shapefile is continental. The second level splits continents into large subunits. For South America, we can see seven large subunits. The third level is where the largest river basins of each continent start to appear. By opening the attribute table of the level three shapefile, we can find the feature which delineates the Piranha River Basin. In this case, feature 24 delineates the Piranha River Basin. Since our analysis is within the selected basin, we use GIS software to take a subset of the data. To do this, we will go to the layer and choose Export, Save Selected Features As, and I'm going to save this into the working folder that I've already created. I will call it Piranha Basin. I'll make sure that the uh, coordinate reference system is what I want, and then I will click OK. We now have a shapefile for only the Piranha River Basin with attributes included. To extract subbasins for the Piranha River Basin, we follow these steps. First, we buffer the Piranha River Basin shapefile we just created. This will allow us to select features in subsequent shapefiles that fall within the buffered shapefile. At the top of the screen, click on Vector, Geoprocessing Tools, and Buffer. For Input Layer, make sure that the Piranha Basin is included. For, ba uh, for Distance, since we're using geographic, coordinate, uh, geographic coordinates, we'll add 0 0.01. And for Segments, we will add 1 and keep all other defaults as they are and click Run. We now have our buffered shapefile. We can use other processing tools to extract the subbasins. If you do not have your processing toolbox open, go to the top of the screen and click on View, Panels, and Processing Toolbox. Once this panel is open, type Extract in the search bar. Under Vector Selection, double click on Extract by Location. This tool creates a new vector layer that contains matching features from an input layer. In the Extract Features From, enter the Level 4 shapefile, which contains the first delineation of subbasins. Make sure that R within is checked, and use Buffered in the dropdown for By Comparing to the Features From. Give the subbasin shapefile a logical name and save it to your working folder. In this case, I'll call it Piranha Subbasin 4, since we, have, since we subset from the level 4 shapefile. And then I'll click Run and Close. 
We now have shapefiles for the Piranha River Basin and the first level of subbasins following the FAF scatter coding system. We can repeat the same process we just used to extract subsequent levels of subbasins. The levels of subbasins required depends on the type of analysis you are doing. This ends the demonstration on data acquisition using the HydraShed's website and how to process the downloaded data for analysis. I will now turn the presentation back over to Amita. Thank you, Sean, for the demonstration of HydroShed. So while we go through some of your questions, just to summarize, um, we went through the importance of river basin management. We reviewed what major freshwater components are required for river basin management. And then Sean demonstrated first how to delineate a particular uh, river basin and subwatersheds within. In the next session, we will have a talk by Dr. Ben Zajcik from Johns Hopkins. He will be showing uh, applications of remote sensing for deriving Nile Basin water budget. And after that, we will have one for Mekong River Basin. And then we will actually demonstrate how to get these components for Prana River and Potomac River subwatersheds. So here is a question answer session. And some of the questions are answered here that you can see the, this document will also be available online later on. So this question, and you can read the answers, but HydroShare resolution is, is lower than SRTM uh, because SRTM is, is a radar and it is affected by um, vegetation. If uh, all the rivers which are smaller or even gorges which are smaller and surrounded by vegetation, they're not resolved properly. So for accuracy purposes, uh, HydroShed derives river networking at a little lower resolution. And the uh, web addresses are, uh, websites are given here that you can review for more information. So yes, HydroShed data you can download um, from HydroShed and then you can view in Google Earth Engine. So if the question three, does water stress mean low level of water? Usually yes, the water stress area means there's more demand than availability of water. But in some cases, um, both extremes are considered water stress. If, if some area is repeatedly flooded, that is also water stress in some sense. So it depends which um, source you are looking at, and it, it's useful to read the definition of water stress areas. How can groundwater storage be obtained from remote sensing observations? Um, as uh, I believe Sean has described here, it is by observing change in gravitational field uh, of Earth. If there is more water, it has more gravitational pull. So that deformation because of change in gravity that is um, noted. So actually all the water in the column from terrestrial water, small, soil moisture, all the way to groundwater, contributes to gravity. And so by subtracting surface water, you can get groundwater. So GRACE data uh, are based on that. And these websites where you can actually download GRACE data, graded GRACE data. The question is about soil moisture retrieval. And these two references are given here that you can look at and perhaps references therein can help you also how to get soil moisture from SMAP and Sentinel-1. So question six, um, if you want evapotranspiration, 
as we saw during the presentation it it is not that easy because transpiration varies a lot it depends on what kind of vegetation there is um, and so it 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 has it's derived from remote sensing it, in better way it has better coverage you can derive uh, vegetation cover a different type from lancet or modis and that has been used to estimate transpiration in addition to um, evaporation so uh, surface energy balance is used in case of lxc and matrix to derive this this transpiration because for transpiration and for evaporation both actually you do need that energy at the surface to evaporate water and so by looking at that evapotranspiration is derived uh, question seven is any of the data ap enabled available via rest services uh, gpm has um, has an app application and you can look at pmm site and i i can give you the address web address you can look at it How does one convert the special resolution from degrees to meters? So in QGIS, of course, as um, said here, uh, you can directly do it. If you actually want to calculate, um, each degree has different meters as latitudes change. But roughly, at equator, a uh, degree is about, um, say, 100 kilometers. And so you can convert that in meters. So as you go up from equator to pole region, uh, area for each degree gets smaller and smaller. So you have to uh, multiply that area by cosine of latitude, actually. That's how you will calculate. But in GIS, uh, you can, that it's inbuilt uh, routine, so you can do it. How to access information on the accuracy of satellite data? That's an important question because um, if you go to each mission or satellite website, each sensor is validated um, and calibrated. So that information is available. Um, validation is done uh, on, on limited uh, geographic regions, not everywhere. So what we recommend is that if you have in situ data you, know, you compare that with satellite data to come up with your own accuracy assessment but just in general to know uh, about validation of each data set or sensor you can go to each mission's website and there is uh, usually a link for validation to validation So here there is an answer that hydro shed products were derived from the shuttle radar topography. Uh, it's every 11 day mission. And also this was um, the Endeavour flew in, in 2000 and 2001. So uh, what you see is what was observed then. You could perhaps Esther that's flying on Terra to look at current conditions. Again, in today's presentation, if you go down to the appendix, uh, there is uh, 
There are slides about SRTM and there is a slide about GDAX. And I will give you a website for that. GDAX also can provide Esther digital elevation that you might be able to use for maybe coastal delineation. So the data portal for GRACE, um, they're given here. Um, and um, uh, it's straightforward that you can just download um, HDF file or NetCDF file from these sites. There is also an um, interactive site, which um, you can try and find out. So this site from Colorado University that provides visualization of GRACE data. So you can visit that. It, you can do time series or maps both by, uh, by years and months. You see that um, how to get soil map from FAO that, that's been described here. So actually, we described um, this in one of our earlier webinars uh, when we introduced WIC hydrologic model, it's variable infiltration capacity uh, model. And if for that, uh, there's information about how to get FAO soil data. So we'll try and get the Oh, yeah. Yeah. So question 13, how to ensure the reliability of remote sensing and model data for water balance without reference to groundwater data set? So that is correct. You, for overall water balance, you have to know ground water. At the same time, though, you also have to know um, irrigation component or, or you know, if water is pumped. So these, in, these are crucial components. Okay? And they are available uh, from GRACE. You can get uh, groundwater data. And you will see this next week when we um, look at Nile Water Basin, how GRACE data are used to look at overall um, water balance. 
But so that assumption is there in here. You are basically looking at surface and subsurface water when you look at gel dust or you can precipitation evaporation is all motion. You are assuming that the variability of that groundwater uh, or it, it's slower than the surface water. So that's one of that's a that's an assumption here. So for for complete balance, of course, you have to have information about groundwater. So um, question 15 here, there are different resolutions between different remote sensing uh, products. Um, one way to do it is actually to, to just interpolate them to the lowest satellite resolution data. Uh, uh, so if you have, say, data at 10 kilometers from, from GPM and you have Landsat evapotranspiration, which is 30 meters, you would upscale Landsat evapotranspiration to 10 kilometers and then, then use that. So that at the lowest resolution, you can derive water budget. That's one way. What we are going to do in the last session is we're going to use GLDAS. So this is a water and energy balance model, as we just saw, uh, that, that integrates remote sensing data along with land surface processing parameterization. So you have all parameters at same special temporal resolution. So it's, it's that way, uh, uses remote sensing information, in some cases in situ information also, and has um, model processing, processes involved, physics is involved in that, dynamics and physics both. So that way, um, sometimes integrated systems like GLDAS um, may be more useful in deriving overall water balance. So here in question 16, Jason has a specific path. How can you say it is better than point data? So the thing, there are two things here. Uh, when we were talking about uh, point data, uh, in situ measurements, yes, most satellites also have their own field of view, and so it's bigger than just a, a point. That's one thing. Another thing is that when you look at larger region, it's the same sensor that is going over. So, so you have several lakes across a country or a region. JSON is the same scatterometer or altimeter that is looking at uh, different lakes. So then it, it there's no difference in calibration between like, so you can compare the, the heights or lake, lake levels that you get from altimeter and JSON would be the same over different regions. If you have in situ measurements, different places will have different types of calibration characteristics and you actually cannot compare them. You know, they both have unique characteristics of their own. Different instruments are measuring in situ data which is true for rain gauges and stream gauges and other data. But if you have satellite, it's the same sensor that goes around the world. So that way there is, there is continuity of measurements. That's one positive point. But in a way you're right, all sensors, they, they are also looking at a big footprint. So, but it's not a point measurement. It's like integrated over some larger region. So yes, JSON that does give um, give image. Also, if you look at the fundamental of remote sensing webinar on our set website, you will see that um, most satellites, the level one and level two data, which are referred to level two data, are geophysical parameters at pixel levels or at orbit levels. Level three data are then space-time composite of these images or orbits so that you have a better spatial temporal coverage. So depending on your application, uh, you would use 
either level two or level three. So yes, level two data probably would be um, more footprint level. I wouldn't say point, but it, it, it's a smaller, higher resolution. Um, level three data would be like an image where you have this um, averaging or composite data available. What products have been shown to have the highest skill for drought and flood monitoring? So this, this is a tricky question because one product may not work the best everywhere. Uh, for example, from remote sensing, trim GPM precipitation is very reliable in, in most of the world. But if you are in mountainous region, then sometimes there are uh, higher inaccuracies. So then maybe you have to combine it with in situ data in that region. So there are several products out there and we always recommend that for your own region, it's good to validate, good to examine different products and come up with the one that is best for you. So in most cases, though, and this is my personal opinion, that um, you, you will be able to see, um, say, drought and flood. So you will be able to see dry or wet conditions. It's the magnitude. If you're looking for that, then you really have to see which data fits the best for your, for your region. So precipitation is one component water budget. Uh, is it used to calculate runoff only, or we are going to use both runoff and precipitation to estimate? So we're going to use runoff from GLDAS, both surface and surface uh, runoff. When we look at water budget numbers or components. So in this case, question 19, we are referring to actual evapotranspiration. Uh, but if you look at GLDAS, as we will, uh, potential evapotranspiration is also available. So question 20, again, um, do you, you're talking about recharge system on urban catchment. Can anyone suggest any ideas how subsurface water can be analyzed? So GLDAS does have subsurface water derived from modeling plus observations, but then resolution is, the highest resolution is quarter degree. So that you have to see whether that's sufficient or not for your catchment. So other, other than that, you just have to develop your own catchment model and that you can force with remote sensing data. So we will go over this question answer again and we'll post that on our set website. So we hope to see you next week exactly at the same time on tw uh, 20th of March. If there are no further questions, then all of us from our set, we want to thank you for attending this webinar and we hope to see you for next three sessions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your participation today, and we hope to see you next week on 20th of March. Thanks. Bye.